The tree of life awaits us, the river of life too. The city of God is ours, made beautiful and new. Paid by the priceless gift of blood for you and me to enter into the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Land of the redeemed, oh, Thank you so much for joining us for Sabbath School on It Is Written TV, a weekly study of the Word of God following uh, the quarterly of the moment, which is a wonderful quarterly, study quarterly, Making Friends for God, authored by Pastor Mark Finley. And what's special about this program is we are joined by this quarterly's author, international evangelist, Pastor Mark Finley. Thanks so much for being here. I'm so excited, Pastor John, about this series of lessons. We're getting so many reports from all over the world about the blessing that it's been to others, and I'm delighted to be with you on It Is Written. This really is a terrific lesson, uh, well, a lesson study. And this week, you know, we're into the eighth lesson, Ministering Like Jesus. I'm going to begin by reading a quote that I think sat on shelves for many years and got covered in dust, but it has been... Uh, re-released in recent times and where we become accustomed to hearing it a little more often and just as well. If I were to ask you, what's the only method that's going to bring true success in reaching people for Christ? Or if I told you that there was only one 
method that would bring true success. You'd want to know what it was. You'd want to find out and you'd do it. So here it is. We read this in a fabulous book called The Ministry of Healing on page 143. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. So evidently there's other kinds of success. It's not all true. Christ's method alone will bring true success. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. The first five words of the opening day's study are these. Jesus genuinely cared for people. Pastor Finley, why is it so important that we keep this in mind? Because if we don't make friends, it's not possible to make a Christian friend. And if we don't make a Christian friend, it's not possible to make a Seventh-day Adventist Christian friend. I love the statement, Pastor John, that you read. It lists five steps in soul winning. First, it says, the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Anybody wrapped up in themselves is a very small package. And here, Jesus mingled with people. He was not aloof. He was not separate from people, but he mingled with them, not desiring his good, but desiring their good. People were not objects that Jesus manipulated for his own self-aggrandizement. So Jesus mingled with men as one who desired their good. That's the first step. He showed sympathy for them. To show sympathy means you have to listen. He didn't do all the talking. He asked pertinent questions. He drew them out. He showed sympathy for them. Then he ministered to their needs. So as we mingle with people, as we are going out of ourself, as we are less interested in our needs and interest, more interested in their needs, as we minister to their needs, as we do what we can to help people practically, he then won their confidence. The prejudice was broken down. He was able to win their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Now, I think it's very important to notice that you don't stop with those four steps. Some people say, well, wait a minute, I'm mingling with people. I'm simply showing sympathy. I'm trying to do some kind of medical missionary work or some kind of social work uh, in the society. I'm winning people's confidence. But Jesus didn't stop there. The purpose of all of that was because they were created in the image of God and he related to them in love, but he was always looking for opportunities to bathe them to follow him. Because what difference does it make really if you really think about it if you give people seven more years of this life, sure, it makes them feel better, it gives them a little better health, you meet a little bit of their needs, but if you don't give them eternity, if you don't give them the opportunity to live with Christ in heaven forever, this life is going to be over, this life is going to be short. So yes, Jesus helped people for helpful sake. He had disinterested benevolence, but whatever disinterested benevolence means, it doesn't mean that we're not interested in their eternal life because we're always interested in helping people know Christ. Yeah, what God has called us to do is encourage people to live longer, not die longer. If all we give them is longer on this earth, essentially they're dying longer. We want to live eternally. And so we look at Sunday's lesson, which is, which is terrific. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that's, uh, that's listed here, John 17, 15 to 18, and then I'll come back and ask you a question or two here. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So Jesus was dealing with sinners. He was dealing with people who are up to here in worldliness. But his attitude towards people, it was, it's worth exemplifying and imitating. Let's talk about Christ's attitude and how he manifested himself towards people who were, well, planning to nail him to a cross. Jesus did not separate himself from the world. There are those people that say, look, I've got to separate from the world. I've got to move way out into the country, and uh, I've got to separate my children from the world. That wasn't Jesus' attitude. Now, there is a call for country living, um, but there's also a call for us to minister to people in the cities. So you have that balance. Somebody said the Christian is like a boat in the water. It's already, it's okay if the boat is in the water as long as there's no water in the boat. In other words, as a Christian, Jesus does not take us from the world, 
but he, he sends us into the world to be its light, to be its salt, to witness to it. So as a Christian family, we want to help our children be separate from the world's influences. When you think of the influences of, of much of the media today, the social media particularly, you think of the obsession that kids have with video games and so forth. So Jesus wants to lead us from the obsession and the shaping and the molding of the things of this world, but he wants to send us equipped into the world with service to bless the world, to transform our world around us by the grace of Christ. So being kept from the evil, but sent into an evil world. We keep in mind that Jesus told us that we are to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. So evidently, as we exist in the sin-darkened world, we are to transmit and communicate light to be light and to be that, that preserving salt and that flavor adding salt. Jesus said salt and light. Now, Monday, very important for us to consider, Jesus' treatment of people. If there was anybody who could have been justified in mistreating people, it'd be Jesus. He had half of town on his back, trying to, trying to run him out of town. Uh, people who were, even his closest followers, were following him for the purpose of gain many times, not out of service, but in order to be served. Uh, Jesus knew there were people plotting against him. There was absolute hatred. There was racism, it was rampant and it was rife. And yet Jesus' goal, I quote from the lesson, was to bring out the best in people, even when the circumstances were unusually challenging. He responded with grace. How can we, Pastor Finley, and what do we learn from how Jesus treated others? I love the story of the centurion and also the story of the in Mark chapter 12, verse 34 of the Jewish scribe, in the story of the centurion, there's an interesting phrase there in Matthew chapter 8. It says the centurion has a servant that is really dying and lying in the bed paralyzed, and Jesus said, I'm going to come and heal him. And the centurion says, no, don't come. All you need to do is speak the word and it'll be healed. And then it says in verse 10, Jesus heard it and he marveled. Divinity marveled. What is it that makes divinity marvel? What is it that makes Jesus marvel? What is it that amazes Jesus? And that's the inner faith of this centurion. So Jesus saw a Roman centurion, one when you think about the Romans, they would drive the nails through his hands. They would put the crown of thorns upon his head. They would pierce his side with the spear. They would nail him to the cross. They would flagellate him in Pilate's courtroom. But yet in this life of the Roman centurion, Jesus saw faith and he marveled. Jesus looked for the good in him. You think of the Jewish scribe in Mark chapter 12, verse 34, same thing. Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. So Jesus did not put labels upon people. Jesus burned his label machine. That's his mental label machine. Never had one, incidentally. And Jesus looked at people, not with the label of a scribe, not with the label of a Pharisee, not with the label of a Roman centurion, but Jesus looked beyond those labels to their hearts. And he did everything he could to nurture the spirituality that was in their hearts, no matter what they said or how they treated him. He tried to pick up on something that he could compliment them for and draw out the best in them. Some beautiful passages are listed here. I'm going to read them. Colossians 4, 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That's, you know, not on the inner circle of the church, the unbelievers, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer every man. Isaiah 42, 3, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. I want to get your thoughts about a comment at the bottom of this has to be Monday. Why is how we say something as important as or even more important than what we say? How do you react to this statement? Pastor Finley, I'll ask you. Truth is truth, and people need to take it or leave it. So what's wrong with that? We've got two minutes. What's wrong with it? Simply, it is abrupt, it is abrasive, and it is confrontational. 
Um, Jesus presented truth in the most attractive way possible. He presented truth. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, here's mashed potatoes, here's a gluten steak, here is a salad, and the plate is dirty, the flies are on the food, food is food, take it or leave it. If you went out to a restaurant and somebody served you a plate of food where the plate was dirty, the, there were flies all over the food, and uh, you may not want to eat that at all. Have you ever noticed that you can look at the same plate of food and some people can serve it really attractively and you, it can look really good to you? Well, it's the same thing with truth. We can present a truth attractively for people, winsomely, in a kind, compassionate way that breaks down their prejudice. Or we can present truth in a very abrupt, abrasive way that simply brings forth conflict. This is why the scripture says, a bruised reed would Jesus not break, a smoking flax. What does that mean, a bruised reed? Jesus saw people that were bruised and hurting, and he presented truth gently and kindly. If Jesus saw a fire in the heart that was just about ready to go out, but just a few smoking embers, Jesus would flame them. So what is that telling us? That we are to fan the flames of a desire for Christ in the hearts of others so they can burst into a mighty flame. We fan the embers so they burst into a flame. Making friends for God is this quarter's Sabbath School Quarterly. In just a moment, Jesus' healing ministry, part one, and part two. We'll have more of Sabbath School on It Is Written TV straight ahead. What does the Bible say about astrology? Why do bad things happen to good people? What color is Jesus? If you have a question, we'd love to find an answer for you from the Bible. Line up online from It Is Written TV. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about studying the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious as well. Well, here's what you do if you want to dig deeper into God's Word. Go to itiswritten.study for the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will take you through the major teachings of the Bible. You'll be blessed, and it's something you'll want to tell others about as well. Itiswritten.study. Go further. Itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Sabbath School on It Is Written TV. We are joined by the author of this current quarterly, Making Friends for God, Pastor Mark Finley. Pastor Finley, let me ask you this. We get to Tuesday, Jesus' healing ministry. Jesus didn't have to be a healer. He just didn't have to. If he hadn't healed people, we, the people of this world, would never have stopped and said, why didn't he heal people? He came to seek and save that which was lost. But healing was an integral part of his ministry. This speaks to us too as witnesses for Jesus because we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and utilize all of the tools that he utilized. A couple of stories we read, I won't dig into them, but one is the story of the paralytic brought by four people to the presence of Jesus. At least the, the account in Mark says it was carried by four. Then there's the woman of the issue of blood in Mark 5 and uh, 25 to 34. Why did Jesus heal? Why did he put so much time and energy into healing? And what do we, as the light of the world, Jesus' witnesses, learn from that? Sin is brokenness. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the world was broken. They opened a door that God wanted forever shut, and that was the door of sickness and suffering and heartache and disease. Sin is essentially separation from God. And when we're separated from God, we're separated from the source of life, separated from the source of health, separated from the source of peace and joy and meaning. When we're separated from God, disease flows. So there's bacteria, there are microorganisms, there are viruses. Uh, the devil impacts us to lead us to make poor choices. Sometimes we bring sickness upon ourselves by the choices we make. If a person has a high-fat diet, they're more predisposed to heart disease. If a person smokes cigarettes, they're more predisposed to cancer. And so you have those choices. Jesus came 
to make human beings whole. In John 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, or destroy, but I've come, Jesus said, to have life, that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. So why did Jesus come? To heal. Because you cannot separate physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual dimensions of human beings. The purpose of the gospel, the good news, is to make us whole to make us whole physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. So the reason Jesus came to heal is because we live in a broken world and he wanted to demonstrate the fullness of God's love in making human beings whole. When we get to Wednesday, which is you know the, the, the Jesus healing ministry part to a continuation of where we just were a moment ago, you introduce Wednesday by speaking about the threefold approach that formed the basis for Christ's ministry. Now, this is interesting. Jesus didn't just play a guitar that had one string on it. Here we're talking about a threefold approach, and that formed the basis for the ministry of Jesus. We are about to learn something here. What is that? Well, in the two passages that we've quoted, uh, Matthew 4, 23 to 25, and Matthew 9, 35, they're essentially the same. And if you look at Matthew, the ninth chapter, it gives you a repeated number of miracles that Christ performed. You have at the beginning of Matthew 9, Jesus forgiving the paralytic. Then you have uh, Jesus uh, restoring to life uh, a a girl that was, uh, had died, and Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood, and two blind men healed in verse 27, a mute man speaks in verse 32. And then in verse 35, it summarizes this healing ministry of Christ, and it says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And Jesus said, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus healed but he never separated healing, physical healing, from the preaching of the gospel. Jesus never separated the work of physical change in people's life and the miracles that he would work from sharing miracles of divine grace. In fact, if you look at the beginning of the chapter, in Matthew chapter 9, it says that when these men brought the paralytic to Christ, Jesus, seeing their faith, said, Be of good cheer to the man, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees and the scribes said he's a blasphemer, and according to verse 6, so that Jesus would let them know that he had power to forgive sins, he said, take up your bed and walk. So sometimes you find Jesus forgiving sin and then working a physical miracle. Sometimes he works the miracle and then forgives sin. This is the larger picture of the gospel that shows Christ's interest in the total person. He did not heal without introducing the gospel. He did not introduce the gospel without healing because the gospel and healing are united and part of that whole abundant life that Christ gives. When we consider, I'm going to jump over to Thursday, when we consider what really matters to Jesus, that's a very big deal. Uh, You've directed us to Matthew chapter 25, so I'm going to turn there, Matthew 25, and I believe we start in about verse 31. There's a really interesting idea. What matters to Jesus? And and here Jesus lists some areas of ministry, not only that are important to him, but that we can learn from. Remember, the lesson is all about making friends for God, the the joy of ministering alongside Jesus, really. Uh, if, if we knew what was important to Jesus and allowed that to form our thinking, we'd say, okay, these are areas that uh, I ought to be involved in as well. So we start in Matthew 25, and, and Jesus says this, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me and I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Some say, well, when did we do this? And Jesus says, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Now, of course, we've already talked about how the idea with witnessing is to get a person to the place where you're introducing the word of God to that person. But this was really important to Jesus, and he dedicated a very significant chunk of Matthew chapter 25 to getting that through to us. What do we learn about Jesus' emphasis on these very important things? 
we learn that Jesus cared for people and that when people were hurting, it broke Christ's heart, that he didn't simply uh, give them what some would call pie in the sky by and by, but Jesus met the specific needs of people. Where they were hungry, he broke bread on the hillside of Galilee and fed 5,000. When they were thirsty, as the Israelites wandered in the desert, he provided water from the rock for them. When the demoniacs were naked, the Bible says that when Christ healed the demoniac, the demoniac was found sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, clothed. Where did he get the clothing? Either the disciples gave it to him or Jesus gave it to him. So Jesus was considered concerned about the whole person. When a church becomes the body of Christ in a given community, it meets needs everywhere in love in Jesus' name. Growing churches are churches that evaluate the community. What's the needs of our community? What's going on in our community? Where can we minister in our community? Where can we be the body of Christ in our community, the eyes of Christ to see need, the mouth of Christ speaking words of hope, the hands of Christ reaching out? Some communities, that's going to mean community service, giving out food and clothing. Other communities that may be more upmarket, that don't need food and clothing, it might be conducting a natural lifestyle cooking school, it might be conducting weight reduction or diabetes programs or depression recovery or family life programs. The point is, the church is the body of Christ meeting needs in the community. The, the fact is, isn't it, if all we think about is, I've got to get a Bible study into this person's hands, that really limits us. The old, the old saw says, uh, many people don't care about what you know until they know how much you care. And uh, I, I think that's really uh, relevant for us as believers today. If you've got a, an atheist neighbor, it's frankly probably a little bit insensitive to, 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 to buy a set of it is written Bible studies and say, I'd like to give you a Christmas gift. Uh, that atheist may, may wonder if you're not getting the message he's told you, she's told you before, I just don't believe this stuff. But they cannot fail to get the message if, if you cut the guy's grass when he had knee replacement surgery or give him a lift to the supermarket when his car broke down. It's important, isn't it, that we think about what reaches a person's hearts when churches get creative and inventive about that and individuals put some thought into that, you start to break down barriers that other things just might not break down. Yeah, it's difficult, uh, Pastor John, to reach a person's mind if you haven't first reached their heart. In other words, unless we break down those prejudices. Now, I think that it's important also to remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 talks about the uh, being clothed, he talks about being fed and, and being thirsty. Certainly, those are very physical issues, but there's another type of thirst as well. That's the thirst of the soul. There's another type of hunger as well. That's the hunger of the heart. There's another type of clothing as well, and that's the clothing of Christ's righteousness that deals with our sin life. So in the Gospels, healing the body is never separated from healing the mind. Healing the body and the mind are never separated from the spiritual, spiritual aspects of healing. So the church is not merely a social entity that meets the social or physical needs of people. Without meeting those social or physical needs, we put barriers up in the community. So the purpose of meeting those needs is to develop relationships where our hearts and minds are open to share the gospel. So in the two minutes that we have, I just imagine that somebody says, that's it, you know, we're, we're going to give away used clothing at church now, we, we're, going to, we're going to create a food kitchen, a soup kitchen, a food bank, or this or that, and so forth. And, and I'm not against any of those ideas, of, of course, as a pastor, I think that's wonderful. But what would you say to someone who is, who is listening to us and they realize, man, I'm inactive. Our church is inactive. We've got a minute and a half. How do they go about addressing that for the purpose of leading people to Christ? First, ask yourself this question. What are the needs of our community? Begin to pray as a church board. Begin to pray in small groups in your church and say, what are the needs of our community? What is our community look, looking for? What is our community hungering for? I'm part of a church called the Living Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church in Haymarket, Virginia. 
One of the things our community is looking for is better health. It's an upmarket community, uh, sometimes a gated, they, there are gated communities there. It's rapidly growing outside of Washington, D.C., and they're interested in health aspects. We've had between seven and 900 guests, visitors, non-Adventists walk through the doors of our church in the last four years. Our church is rapidly growing. Now, if I were in the inner city and the need was for education, we might run a computer class out of our church. We might run a food bank out of our church. My brother-in-law, who's a pastor, has run food banks out of some of his churches for many, many years, and they've seen people come 60, 70 on a Wednesday night when they've fed them, and they've seen baptisms out of that. So what I would say is begin to pray that God will help you and your church to know the needs of your community, and then do something. It's better to do something than it is to do nothing. And experiment with various forms of outreach for your community. See what works, and always integrate physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. And your church will grow for Jesus, and you'll find new satisfaction in witnessing. Pastor Finley, it's always wonderful. Thanks so much for being part of Sabbath School this week. I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us next week, developing a winning attitude. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be another fantastic lesson. We'll see you then for more Sabbath School on It Is Written TV. Hello friends, my name is Tarumbi Zachiwai and my favorite team is 296, All The Way My Savior Leads Me. All The Way My Savior Leads Me has become one of my favorite songs because um, it reminds me of where I have been, all the troubles, all the good times and all the bad times that I have gone through. And because of this, uh, even if we are faced with this deadly pandemic that we have of the coronavirus, we know that the Lord will keep us safe. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to the Kablonga SDA Children's Corner. Um, our theme for today is the love of God. I would like to introduce you guys to my very special friends. This is Uncle M, uh, this is Mark Waza, and uh, this is Bombo. Say hi, guys. Hi! Before we do anything else, we're going to have a Bible reading from Uncle M and a prayer from Mark Waza. Okay, children, I hope you have your Bibles with you. Let's turn to the book of John, chapter 3 verse 16 the bible says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life amen amen, amen. so pray dear jesus bless us your children and be with us and help us be good boys and girls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So right now we're going to sing a song. I think let's sing Let the Rain Fall Down. No, 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 no. No, 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 no we want jungle. We want jungle. We want jungle. Okay, fine. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll like sing that on later. So let's, we're going to sing jungle. Yeah!
was amazing. So guys, that end of the song, you want us to sing? Yes, yes, yes. What song? With a bang, 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 and, and a so, so, so. 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 Ah, I don't know that one. Maybe you guys need to sing it for us. Okay. okay. With a bang, 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 and a so, so, so. A bang, 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 and a so, so, so. A bang, 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 and a so, so, so. No one built the eye. Here comes the land with the oh, oh. Here comes the land with the roar, roar. Here comes the land with the roar, roar. No one built the eye. Here comes the pig with the oink, oink. Here comes the pig with the oink, oink. Here comes the pig with the oink, oink. No one built the eye. I am now joined by my friends, Uncle Chipo and Uncle Wumba. They're going to help me explain this simple, simple craft that I want us to do together. Um, I want you to get a paper and a pen or a crayon or a pencil or anything that you can use to write. Then I want you at the top of the paper, I want you to write our theme for today, which is the love of, of God. Then if you want, you can even underline it. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you've done that by now. So now, what you're going, what we're going to do together, I want us to draw a big cross. A very, very big cross. A very big one. Enough space for us to write in. A very, very big cross. That same cross that Jesus died. A very, very big cross. Like okay, so in the middle of the cross here, I want you to write Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -S. Then at, on one side of the cross, I want you to write on top, I want you to write my sins. So on this part, I want us to list some of the, the sins that we've committed, the bad things that we did, like, we've done, like lying, Stealing sugar or fighting. He's bullying my young brother, I see. Yes, it most definitely is. Or fighting, yes. I'm bullying Jimon. <laughs> or fighting or insulting or anything like that. Done that? Mm -hmm. So that's it. On the other side of the cross, I want you to write my friend's sins. So this side, this side, I want you to list those things, those things that your friends have done towards you. Those not your friends again. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they were fighting as well. Maybe you know they were lying. Maybe you know they were stealing. Maybe, maybe you know they were bullying their friends. Have you done that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now. At the bottom of the cross, I want you to write our verse for today, which is John 3, verse 16. John 3, verse 16. Okay, so now I'm going to explain to you why we've done this. So, when you look at this, you see that Jesus is at the center of this cross and the sins you've committed and the sins your friends have also committed, they are on both sides of the cross, which means they are equal. What I'm trying to tell you is that I know sometimes we think that the sins that our friends have done are worse than the sins that we've committed, but I must say that it's not true because Jesus died for all of our sins. Because as it says in John 3, it tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have the last in life. Right? In telling us that, even though 
we've seen and you know our friends have seen doesn't just because just because you think what they've done is the same thing they're saying the westerners because jesus died for all our sins he did not pick and say i'm going to die for this one i'm going to die for this one he said he's dying for all of our sins yes. mm-hmm. you guys have no. Okay, so this is so this is yeah, so if you want, you can hang this in your bedroom, you can put it on your wall, on your door, or anything like that. Yeah.
Good afternoon, the Church of the Living God. We want to thank God for the blessing of the Sabbath. We want to thank God for even keeping for, for even keeping us in this in this pandemic. Uh, this afternoon, allow us to go and to turn our Bibles from Luke 23, from verse number 39. Uh, the title of this message is "Lord, I need another chance." Lord, I, I need uh, another chance. Let's read from Luke 23, uh, verse number 39, and I'll read from my, my Bible. And the Bible says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear God, seeing that, that, that you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justify and we receive our due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. Verse number 43. And Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember, we are learning from Luke 23, uh, verse number 39 to 40. And the title of this message is, Lord, I need another chance. The Bible is very clear that they have, they had taken Christ from Gethsemane. After Gethsemane, they went to him and to Annas the priest. After Annas the priest, the Bible is very clear that he went straight to the Sanhedrin. After the Sanhedrin, he went straight to, to, to Pilate. After Pilate, he went straight to Herod. After, after Herod, he went, back, he went back to Pilate. It was a night of torture while from another king, from another uh, judge to another judge. And when Pilate said, I, I want to wash my hands because I don't want to have anything to do uh, because of this man, the chief priests and the Pharisees together with the mob took Jesus straight to the Calvary uh, where he was supposed to be crucified. And the Bible is very clear that on verse number 49, he was crucified among the two thieves. When you read the book of Isaiah, the reason why Christ was in the middle of the two thieves it was to represent that he was the greater criminal than others. And the Bible simply says, uh, while least he was now dying, the last moments of Christ's death, a conversation occurs on, on the Calvary between him, him being raised between the two thieves. And the other thieves say, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. Uh, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. You read the book of Matthew, while Christ was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came and said unto, and said unto him, If you are the Christ, change these stones into bread. Uh, you read again when Christ was being tortured. The Bible is very clear that the chief priest and the Pharisees say to him, If you are the Christ, call unto the angels, call to your father so that he can save you. So the, the, the phrase, if you are the Christ, didn't origin with humanity. But it was the devil's statement that he used for Christ not to die on the cross. So he said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and also save us. That the thief wanted Christ to prove to him through works that he is Christ. I, I, I heard one, one, one songwriter singing that Christ is Christ even in the mountains and Christ is Christ even in the valleys. Christ or God does not, he, does, does not need to prove his Godhead to you to believe that he is God. He is God without proving and he is God even in proving. He is God when you, seek, when you are sick, he remains God. When you are healthy, he remains God. He is God when, when you don't have fees for school. He is God when you have fees for school. He is God when you die. He, he is also God when you live. That the God yet of God is not changed by the calamities of humanity. He is God when you are broke. He is, called, he is also God when you are rich. So the, the thief says, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. So he wanted Christ or Jesus to prove that he is Jesus through his request of saving him. How many of us have did the same prayer request in our homes, in our schools, even in our churches? That we have prayed more prayers to God saying, if you are God, do this for me. And if you are God, do this for me. Yet Christ is Christ with or without proving for you. In vernacular, they say, avo, avo, kuti uprove, kuti avo. 
but mutwe muavo muavo kunyango sina maavo to indicate very clear that the avo tree even if with even if without avocados who will remain in avo in an avocado tree and the bible is very clear that uh, jesus then kept silent and the other one said and he rebuked the second thief do not do you not fear god that were in the same condemnation for this man is right and upright he, he, does, he didn't do anything to deserve this but we are sinners and we are we are criminals we deserve this and he looked towards he looked straight into into the christ eye and he says uh, remember me when when thou comest into thy kingdom and, and jesus replied uh, indeed and verily i uh, will remember you into my kingdom on calvary there are two people that are praying and both are sinners and both they know christ and both they know the capability of what christ can do the reason why the first thief said to christ save yourself and also save us he had the history of christ's miracles saving humanity to my thought he had he had jumped and thought of john chapter 2 when christ changed water into wine on john chapter 2 he knew that christ this same christ he was also able to raise lazarus from the dead he is he even knew of john chapter 6 when christ multiplied bread uh, and fed 5000 so he knew the power and the capability of christ of saving humanity hence he knew that the same power that christ used in the past he was oh, he was he, he was also able to use it on the cross to save himself and i and him he didn't know something that christ when he when he was dying on the cross it was for us humanity for you and me to be saved he he wanted christ to save himself and also save the criminal and they ran away so that they can run away but in but in expense or in expense of humanity that was following if christ was was to to come down from that cross you and me no one was going to be saved so the thief wanted to to be saved uh, in expense of other salvation but the other one rebuked him and saying ah oh, this man is very just for i and you we receive these consequences to our due reward but lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and the bible simply says he replied and said verily verily i say unto you today i will we, i will be with you in paradise what happened to the second thief that he drew the attention of christ one author writing about this issue he actually said christ stopped dying for a moment to reply to the prayer of the penitent thief what happened to this thief that when even in the last moments of christ he was worth the attention of christ and he was also worth the reply of christ those that have commented they have said on this issue the thief on the cross didn't keep the sabbath the thief on the cross didn't pay tithe and offerings. The thief on the cross never visited the sick or the lame. The thief on the cross never attended a care meeting, but he died with an assurance that most of us don't even have. But we have more than 10, 15 years, 20 years coming to church. But a statement and a minute with Christ, the thief on the cross was saved. You read the Bible very well where Christ where he had 12 disciples and the Bible is very clear that he walked with these 12 disciples for, for three and a half years before he died. He, he died on the cross and one of the disciples was, the, was Judas by name. Judas spent three and a half years with Christ but he was lost after three and a half years. The thief sp spent the, the whole life stealing Thieving, doing a lot of criminal activities but a minute with christ he died with salvation it's not the moment or it's not how much time you spend with christ it's about how much time you spend and how much relationship that you have built with christ most of us we have worked with christ since our childhood most of us we are, we are even born at when just born, born and bred we are we are even known uh, to our totems we are even known by doing good things at church uh, actually the eldership it actually rains on our family your, grand, your grand grandfather was an elder 
Your son will be an elder. Your father was an elder. You have a born and a very strong background of Adventism. My question to you is, do you have the assurance that you will be in paradise? Most of us have did a great uh, experience with Christ. We, we, we flash back our minds a bit. We, we see Christ and I working, preaching together. We see Christ helping us to sing even to churches. We see even Christ helping us even to give to the poor. My question to you is, do you have the assurance that we, you, you will be in paradise? But a minute that was well spent on the cross, the thief on the cross died with this assurance. May God help us. May God help us on this issue that we know that it is not about how, uh, the number of years that you have spent with Christ, but it's how much you have did in those years. And the Bible simply says, Christ replied to him, and he said, Indeed, I will be with you in paradise. There's the difference between the first and the second thief. The first thief wanted Christ to help him physically. So he, wa he didn't want to die on the cross. He wanted Christ to help him on the cross so that he can... He can, he can be saved physically. He didn't want to die on the cross. But the second thief wanted to die, but with an assurance of having uh, the, the, the paradise to come. So he said, Christ, give me this assurance that even if I die today, is there life after my death? And Christ gave him this assurance. Let me challenge you this afternoon. How many of us are willing to say, God, it's better to take the whole world and give me Jesus. How, how, how much of us are willing to say, even Christ, if I die on this sinful world, I want to die with, with this assurance in my heart and in my mind that I will be in heaven. How many of us who say, God, even if I don't get a degree, a well-educated degree, even if I don't get what I want, even if I die unmarried, even if I die poor, I want to die with this assurance in my heart that there is a heaven that I'm going to obtain. How, much, how many of us are going to say, uh, God is better, it's better God, to lose this earth and to lose this life on earth and gain, and gain, and gain the heaven to come. And the, th and the second thief, on the cross was willing to do that. He said, Christ, I might die today. Christ, it's, it's very unfortunate that I might die on this cross because I deserve it. These are consequences of my sins and of my sin that I have do, I have did. But help me, God. I want to die with this assurance that my name is written in heaven. And on that note, Bible simply, the Bible is very clear that then Christ smiled at him and surely he opened his mouth and gave him an assurance, verily, verily, I will be with you in paradise. Most of the prayers that we have prayed, Christ might not answer. If we pray the prayers of the first thief for us to be saved in Calvary, it's very unfortunate that Christ sometimes he might not answer those ones. But the prayers of the dying saints who say, God, I'm a sinner, Help me and remember me in paradise. Christ replies instantly. Check your prayer records. Check your prayer lines. When you pray to God, are you willing? And is your prayer a prayer that is salvific? That is a salvation on the end of it. Or we are praying for, for, for Christ to save us on the cross. And the Bible is very clear that the first and the second thief both have the same opportunity. The first and the second thief both had the eleventh hour to utilize. The first and the second thief both had Christ on their side, but the other one was lost and the other one was saved. So let me challenge you this afternoon that we all receive equal opportunities for us to be saved. The same divine service that you have had is the same divine service that she is going to have. The, the same divine service we are going to listen to, but our decisions are going to be different at the end of the story. The same care meeting that we have attended is the same care meeting that she attended. The same care meeting that they also attended, but the results are different. That humanity, when God, when God do the salvific 
equation for humanity to be saved. We are all given equal opportunities for us to be saved. But it is what we do with the opportunities, and it is what we utilize the opportunities, the mechanic, no pure for us to be saved. And the Bible is very clear that on the thief, the, 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 the two thieves on the cross, one was saved and the other one was lost. But the other one was lost because he didn't utilize the Christ that was so close. And the other one was saved because he said a statement that was worth Christ listening to. Real Lord, remember me in your paradise. And Christ replied and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I will be with you in paradise. Before I pray this afternoon, let me say this. The world is, is going to an end. Christ is soon coming. All the events and all everything that leads and points to his coming and all the signs that lead and, fulfill, uh, uh, and to be fulfilled, we are almost there. But before Christ comes, we must have this assurance in our hearts, this assurance in our minds, this, our, this assurance in our, in, in our life, that Lord, remember me in thy paradise. It's better to lose this earth. It's better to be poor on this earth. It's better not to be uneducated on this earth and have a life to come. Don't be, dispra don't be dispersed. Christ is seeking to give us another chance. Upon the life of a thief, a life of misery, a life of all the criminal activities that you can talk about, he died and God gave him another chance of Calvary that indeed I will be with you in paradise. May God help us even if in this pandemic when people are dying, lives are perishing, to pray this prayer of the second thief. Lord, remember me in your paradise. And I will tell you, surely Christ will smile at us and he will tell us, indeed, I will be with you in the paradise. Be blessed. I wake up in the morning, I get on my knees. I did learn from the master, he taught me to pray. I read on from the scriptures, the patience of Job. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel you are alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. When you get into trouble, lift up your head and look up to the mountains where your help comes from. You surely have a refuge all night or day. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend, the only comforter when you feel you are alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Why don't you trust in him? He's faithful and true. He promised to take us home on his soon return. Oh, don't and never look back. Believe in his word. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend. The only comforter when you feel you are alone. He will be there when you cry out. Keep on your faith and live with hope. Jesus is the Redeemer and friend. The only comforter when you feel you are alone. He will be there yes, when you cry keep out. On keep faith. on your faith and live with hope. He will be, he will be there will be 
when you cry out, keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out, keep on your faith and live with hope. He will be there when you cry out. Oh